Welcome back, Visions fans. Ready Player Will here. Today we got Velus dropping to global, so let's get into the character review. This presentation is going to be a character overview, report card, and stat analysis for Velus compared to some of the supports, my general thoughts about the character overall, the class and job overview, talking about the abilities in particular, and then I have an AI slash auto analysis where I've already built the character for you all, and I've tested out how the AI prioritization works with its healing, his buffs, attacking, etc. So I'll go through all of that for you. And then I'm going to talk about notable vision cards, notable espers, weapons, and then some trust stone recommendations. For the character overview, brand new ice element unit. He is the crystal warrior for... Uh, War of the Visions, which is his unique job that they've given him. He also has the Scholar and Arithmetician sub-jobs as well. He can equip books, and then it also equips hats, cloths, and accessories with a move of three and jump of one. For element resistances, pretty standard for an ice unit. And then for weapon resistances, only negative is to strike, minus 15%. Uh, no resistances to pierce or missile, which is uh, it's fine. And then 10% to magic and 5% to slash. So overall, compared to his other supports, as we'll see in a second here, this is actually starting off pretty good. And then in terms of status ailments, because he is a 97 faith unit, he does have a couple that may be more popular in the future, but aren't all that impactful. It's 50% to sleep and then 50% to paralyze with 10% to stun. The stun one's actually kind of noteworthy. The other two are not as impactful of status ailments, but overall not horrible. Now we get to the report card. A little bit different here because we're looking at him from the perspective of a support as opposed to, you know, the DPS and tanks in the game, if you will. And just from that perspective, effective HP, again, defining that, it's essentially his hit points, but it's been adjusted for things like defense, spirit, and certain resistances to become more of a metric of how much damage do you have to do as opposed to what the actual health points are. And from that perspective, he is an A. He's absolutely fantastic, the best support in the game in terms of effective HP. Now, obviously, compared to your average DPS, maybe a little bit squishier in terms of effective HP, but he's got some survivability that we're going to get into more soon. From a physical perspective, in terms of physical incoming damage it's an a minus a little bit worse and that's really just because he's got more innate spirit than he does defense with the minus 15 percent to strike being the real kind of like negative and lock does technically have a monk some job so we might see more of that incoming but i wouldn't be terribly worried the magic hp though is really an a plus all of the supports here on the left it might be a little difficult to read but this is just a very high level from a base hp perspective he is definitely on the higher side where he's at this 2954 anytime you give hp up in terms of vision cards or trust stones or whatnot, it will scale off the base HP. So the fact that he is relatively high compared to most of the other supports is a good thing. And his total HP ends up being about tied with Halloween Leela as well, but he's got way more survivability than ours. We'll get to in a second, but overall health points, definitely top of the support list. From a defense and spear perspective, he is one of the few supports that does have some innate defense and spear. Now here, I am slightly overestimating his defense number here, where I have a passive that gives him 12 defense that you may not always have on. I personally would. Either way, he does have 6 defense, he's got 12 spirit, and you are going to almost always have the passive on that gives him an additional 12 spirit. So he will be at that 24 mark at the minimum for most of all of your content. And if you're looking at the rest of them, it's really only Minwoo and Mashiri, and Mashiri is not popularly used in Minwoo's kind of niche. So from a just pure support or common support perspective, definitely a ton of survivability there. And then the weapon resistances, it's kind of a trope at this point that most of the supports have negative resistances across the board at least for the physical damage type so the fact that he is you know five zero minus 15 zero and ten is already very much different from the rest of them and it goes a very long way for him lasting longer in battle for finally the the weighted effective hp at the end of it really being significantly higher than most of them considering that he's got the defense and spirit that they don't have in addition to the resistances and the hp overall really fantastic for him not to mention how could i leave this out with that passive that gives the 12 spirit he also has 20 aoe resistance so another big part of his survivability overall we get into the rest of the report card here so primary stat perspective he is an a his base magic is equal to yuna and halloween Leela, and obviously you can build that up accordingly the sports do tend to skew toward having the highest magic stats in the game just so they can output a lot of healing and he does have some damaging abilities that are obviously going to benefit from that as well like the other sports potentially do from an agility perspective, he is a C. He does have average agility, but as we're going to see soon, he does have a uh, haste ability, haste buff that he will use for himself and a teammate, which drastically changes the turn order. So the agility is overall just a slightly deceiving metric here because haste, which he probably will use extremely often, uh, is going to alter that completely. So take that with a grain of salt. From an accuracy perspective, he is a C+. Uh, his innate accuracy is 6% less than the UR average. So the average UR, he's just slightly below their average. He does have the scholarly intuition passive, which is the one that also has the defense that I put on. It also gives him 20 accuracy, which does actually put him, when you consider all passives, 
And then even in the scenario where you give him 35% luck, it puts him at the UR average. So that passive in particular does a lot of good things for him. But his limit break is a 100% chance hit. So overall, he does still have opportunities to damage enemies, but you probably are going to want to emphasize some accuracy if you plan on having him do a lot of damage. But his AI doesn't really cater to that, so you don't have to worry too much about it. And we'll talk about that more when we go over his AI. From an evasion perspective, he is a C-. minus. He is slightly below the average. Don't even worry about gearing him for evade. He's likely not going to do anything with it. Movement's also a C. That move of three, jump of one, doesn't change. He's got no other abilities that alter that. So straight average, which is fine. Uh, Passivize is an A-. minus. He's got some absolutely stellar passives. Uh, only a couple that I really think are going to use the majority of the time, but they are really good passives by themselves. From the counter perspective, this is probably one of the weaker parts of his kit. I give him a B overall. There's literally nothing special there. We'll talk about that in a second. The overall kit is an A-, minus, though, and probably could be closer to an A, just given how potent some of the abilities are. For a final grade of an A, he is a fantastic support, probably going to be the best in the game for the foreseeable future. My general thoughts overall, as we've talked about, uh, support with great survival potential with uh, great effective HP, protect and shell on one of his buffs, 20 AoE resistance, and his limit break also gives him a physical barrier for three hits, so 50% damage reduction on physical hits. Uh, he is more than just healing as well, which is fantastic for support, where it's not just someone feeding a tank health pool, where he does have double haste for himself and an ally in the same ability. He's got an AP restore on the main job as well, that when he heals someone, he will give them AP. And then his TMR is the same thing, where he'll also restore AP to teammates nearby. Uh, the sub jobs do leave for some versatile builds, which is really cool, will help you for a variety of PvP and PvE content, uh, which he does have an amazing potential for, so really going to dive into that in a second. And then he is a future meta unit for the ice and water synergy where uh, Celeste just got released. We're going to get our story in a month or two. And he's really a big part of like supporting what they do best. So uh, he, at least on the JP side, was a very prevalent part of that. I could definitely see the same being here, even if it doesn't end up being water. If it ends up being light instead, I could still see him being amazing for that reason. Now we get into the passive abilities. Everlasting Stone to me is an absolute must for always having on, where increased spirit by 12, increases healing power by 20, and then increases AoE resistance by 20. I've talked about healing power in the past, how you calculate it. It's essentially your magic stat, and then it's times the modifier of the healing ability you use. So I think Kiraga off the top of my head is like 240%. So you take your magic stat, multiply it by 2.4, and then there's a little bit of faith calculation at the end where you take your faith into account as well as the person you're healing's faith into account. And so when you increase healing power by 20, essentially what that means is your Kiraga, which is 240% modifier, is now 260% modifier. So that ends up being more potent. So definitely have that on. My other second favorite here is Scholarly Intuition, which I think you should have on almost all the time, just for the defense and the accuracy. Although the magic of 30% is nice, I do think you can get that externally easier for other things. The knowledge reserves, I don't think you're ever going to need because a lot of his healing can be insta-cast. And then the height 3 and height 2 and the level 4 to level 3, which are the arithmetician passives, are obviously a little more niche for maps. So there's a time and place where you actually might want to prioritize those over scholarly intuition, but that's obviously situational. The counter abilities, these are the ones that are relatively lackluster. Uh, cold Comfort and Reactive Force really aren't anything. It's basically just uh, counter attacks with different ranges and different percentages to proc. Boring, to be honest. I would probably prefer to have damage distribution on where uh, it will absorb HP from your target uh, 50%. Out of the three of them, I think this is probably the one that fits best. It's certainly no Aeon Bond, but definitely can still keep him alive longer. Now we get into the main job. I'm going to talk about the offensive abilities first and then get into his buffs and support, which is kind of awkward for a support character, but go with me here. So Ice Spike, nothing special here. It's a magic attack, 121%, 13 AP. Every character has an ability like this in their kit. Sub-Zero is a fantastic ability, though. This is, again, one of those things that when you talk about PvE content, you get a ton of potential here where it's a decreased ice resistance of 38% for three turns to the target with a decent amount of damage. 220% is a large amount. It does have a cast time associated with it, though. Uh, as opposed to Ice Spike, which is an insta-cast. And then the decreased ice resistance will apply whether he hits the target or not. So that at least is the saving grace that you will still get the imperil. Then the third, the Eternal Frost ability. It's another one that has a cast time. 220% modifier as well. It's a much larger AoE and will increase his damage output. This one's probably not as impactful because you probably won't be spamming a lot of you know offensive abilities in a row. But you might, so this is definitely a fantastic ability for that situation. Now we get into the, the buffs here, uh, or the support abilities. Snow healing is absolutely fantastic, where it's a very large and forgiving AoE. Uh, restores HP of 210% for the allies, and restores AP of 
15 to those allies as well so really fantastic support buff uh, excuse me i actually went out of order here ice blessing uh, is a one of my favorite abilities it's the protect and shell as well as a magic buff of 40 percent for himself so there is a a turn order of when he'll end up using either of these but ice blessing is absolutely fantastic and then stars of swiftness is kind of like the big shiny toy that everyone sees when they look at velas and it's a uh, grant haste to himself and an ally which is just absolutely incredibly potent in addition to what he can do offensively and curatively as well when we get to the Crystal Warrior sub job, though, uh, Frost Drift is a, an interesting ability. It, I do like the ability to inflict Frostbite on the enemies, and it does have a higher chance to proc if there's a certain condition met. I think this phrases it incorrectly. I do need to double check, though, but this is not a bad ability. I would potentially keep this on, provided you're going against some, like, mage-type characters where they'll have 97 faith and they will have higher AP pools, so Frostbite will impact them very quickly with higher... Uh, higher frequency and then lethargic break is a great ability but probably one you're using only for pve since there's no damage attached to it that i doubt the ai would ever use this in actual combat but it's still a great ability decrease ap and decrease ct those are things that always help in pve content now for the scholar sub job this is a very interesting sub job in that there's always a ton of ways to build it because it's got three very unique and distinct buffs that do three different things overall i don't think that the offensive abilities really do anything impactful here that the main job doesn't already do and he's not really known for attacking anyway so you don't have to worry too much about it but to me this is where ability like law of speed reading to restore that ct and decrease the uh, activation time which he does have a little bit innately because the mastery which we'll get to in a second here but i do like this one out of the three probably the most glacial calling is a little more hit and miss just because it's such a big aoe you can sometimes make the ai do weird things in terms of movement so uh we'll talk more about that soon the arithmetician sub job is absolutely fantastic for its flexibility in terms of height and range obviously we know how strong the arithmeticians are it obviously gives them some upside too from a, a damage perspective where these are insta cast no cast time and you can get you know you can put him in position where he can use abilities before anyone takes any damage. So overall, I don't know if there's a strong case for either one. I probably would lean toward the Arithmetician sub-job over the Scholar sub-job, quite frankly. But the Scholar one has a little bit more utility that I think you can play with a little bit more. And then just for these abilities, you're probably more, you know familiar with them already. It's basically two single target uh, abilities, one curative, one damaging, and two AoE abilities, an AoE cure and an AoE damage. It's pretty standard with the uh, the disable and CT average, which are PvE oriented, not PvP oriented. Now we talked about the limit break here. The limit break's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it is on the smaller side in terms of damage area, but that's fine. It's a 100% hit chance, and it gives them the physical shield for three uh, times, not three turns. Important distinction. The TMRs, for an accessory, this is absolutely fantastic, where good enough stats for the TMR, but the ability itself is particularly fantastic, where you decrease the AP consumption for your teammates and restore AP for them as well. So they're just going to be able to spam a bunch of abilities, and if you can take off uh, Ziza Bells on a teammate and allow them to use a different buff instead that allows for a ton of extra flexibility where they don't have to be forced to use Ziza Bells on turn one. And then for the mastery ability, uh, the decreased chance of being targeted I think is a very interesting one. I need to play with this more, but my gut feeling is, and I know this for a fact, you cannot go below zero hate, which means you can't start off the battle with negative three hate. But what I think it does is if you put Velus in slot one whenever you do a battle, well, whoever's in slot one uh, starts off with effectively one hate. That's kind of what it shakes out to be. So if you are in a team where you don't have a tank that has an eight hate, if you put him in the battle, his one will essentially be zero, I think. I, I really need to look at that more. But because it's uh, a mastery ability and it applies at the start of the battle, I don't know how else you could possibly think of it. But either way, it's some interesting potential. If, if you were to put the bow tie on him, which has hate associated with it, this would effectively like, cancel out that hate. Uh, that will, you know, decrease his movement, keep him more in the back lines. So I think there is like a strategy to, to work with that. Uh, and then the decrease of skill activation time obviously helps for some of the, the main job abilities as we saw. Now for the AI slash auto prioritization, this is one of the most important things, particularly for a healer, where you want to get to know how aggressive they are, when do they heal, when do they not, what buffs do they use, because uh, that's what the entire kit, that's like literally all of their value, right? Well, he will heal low health teammates rather than attack. That's number one. That's not always the case for people that have curative abilities. Black Rosalina is a great example of that. You could have Arithmetician on, but she will always attack enemies rather than heal her allies. That's not the case with Velus. If you have a low health teammate next to you, and it's usually like 50% or lower, that's kind of the ballpark, he will opt to heal them rather than attack an enemy, even if he can one-shot that enemy. So important to remember. 
Number two, he will typically stand still for a lot of these buffs. Some characters, I know like Golbez is kind of one in particular where I was testing, where when he does his like his scholar ability, the umbral, whatever, which is the unit resistance, he'll cast it, but then he'll move forward. From what I saw preliminarily, Velris does not do that. He will buff, he will cast it, but stand still. So to keep that in mind that he does have kind of that support AI where he will, you know, stand still when he's using a lot of these buffs rather than be aggressive and move forward. Uh, and he will attack an enemy in range rather than use the buffs. If the enemy is in range, you know, if your teammate's full health, what I mean by that is if you have a very small guild war map and it's like turn one, everyone's full health, right? Uh, if you have an enemy that comes into range of him, he will not use his haste ability on the teammate. He will instead opt to move forward and damage that enemy. So there is an interesting wrinkle there in terms of how he prioritizes attacking versus buffing. Obviously, if there's not an enemy in range, he'll go through the buff order that we're about to talk about. So if he is by himself, meaning there's no teammates in range whatsoever to, to do potential buffs on, and you have the Scholar subjob on, and I specify that because on his Crystal Warrior subjob, he doesn't have any buffs, so there's no reason to look at it. And then the Arithmetician one, there's no buffs either. It's, it's cure or damage. So it's really only the Scholar subjob that you got to play with. And the priority of buffs when you have the Scholar subjob on is, number one, Frostwave Vivication, that's his TMR ability. So I did test it with his TMR. He will always use, use his TMR ability first. Even if he's by himself, he will use it on himself. Secondly, he'll use Ice Blessing. Now, Ice Blessing is that ability where he gives himself Protect and Shell. He will not be able to use his Haste ability if there's no teammate nearby, because that's part of the condition. It's that you give Haste to yourself and a teammate. If there's no teammate, he won't use it at all. Uh, the third one, Law of Preservation, that's the defense buffing one on the Scholar Super Job. The Law of Speed Reading is the one that decreases CT uh, casting time. And then Glacial Calling is the Scholar ability that is the unit resistance and evocation gauge rate up. So that's the order of buffs. If he does not have any teammates in range, doesn't have an enemy in range, um, that's what you expect. Things slightly change when there is a teammate in range though. So he will still use his TMR first if there's a teammate in range. But he will secondly prioritize the haste ability second. So Stars of Swiftness will be the second buff ability, again, provided that there's no enemy in range that he can attack instead. After that, you'll actually notice a little bit of a shuffle here where Glacial Calling will actually become third, where formerly it was fifth. And again, that's the large AoE that gives unit resistance up in the evocation gauge. So if you are near units, you have that on, that will shuffle up above ice blessing which i don't know if i like i actually don't like it i'll just be honest uh, ice blessing is the protecting shell i feel like that's a such a critical buff to get off that like i wouldn't want to risk it or not being able to use it because of glacial calling and then finally law of preservation and speed reading basically the same order but that's kind of how you want to keep things in mind when you think of like what do you need to turn on and turn off in terms of getting the buffs off that you want uh, appropriately now we get into notable vision cards this is supremely interesting and i say that because although the ice cast has a bunch of really good vision cards it's really not that many that are magic oriented so the first one to me that's like kind of the de facto best vision card for him uh, as an ice unit in particular and again the big wrinkle to this is that you are going to potentially intertwine him with water units as well so really is a toss-up whether or not you're going to go for you know mono ice element comps or whether you're going to put him in a water comp and maybe put like a water vision card on him instead so that teammates get the ability but not him or do you go for some rainbow vision cards we're going to talk a little bit about all of them but the de facto number one for me for ice has to be freeze's vision card this is such a good one where it gives him four defense it's obviously very magic oriented increasing his stats for magic hp and magic resistance it's also ice attack up which will affect all of his offensive abilities crit damage and also bulks up his hp by 25 percent which as we saw is among the higher ones of the support so this is a overall fantastic card for not only himself but all of the ice units obviously because uh, these party buffs will apply to everybody regardless whether they're physical or magical damage dealers and here's the thing i don't want to say that's it because obviously there's more you can do but like, there's not a lot else. I think the only other one that might potentially be viable is the Shiva card, if only for the critical evasion of 20, but you're obviously losing a ton in this card because unless you're running an evade comp, you're basically wasting your party effect here. I do think a half decent uh, MR rarity one is the Moogle card here, where it increases magic for the party, increases accuracy of 18 to everybody, not just ice units, so that's at least another good rainbow card here. And obviously the stats and the unit effect are a little more niche and, and lackluster, but still some, some good party buffs overall, considering this is also a, a you know rainbow comp potential, where if you're putting it with water, 
he and the water units will benefit. I think a couple other interesting ones that you can play with, but certainly aren't necessarily the greatest by any means. I think Typhon is another also fantastic card where, you know, we talked about him being subpar in terms of accuracy, where this luck on both the unit and the card will buff up his accuracy overall. It will also increase magic attack and accuracy to the party as a rainbow comp, so I think that's super strong as well. Overall, I think the combination of those two things uh, you know, can significantly help your team. I do think Remu is obviously like the default best sub Esper if you can't think of anything else just because of the, the magic 50%. That'll help him uh, with his curative ability, just healing more if his magic stat is higher. And then an underrated sneaky one that I think that uh, uh, I kind of am sad that I'm going to talk about it here because I almost wanted to like be selfish about it and try to make it work for myself. Uh, Fleeting Blossom Banquet I think is a super interesting one where the unit effect you're getting 10% light resistance we're obviously we're in a light meta the stat although a little bit lower on the magic side not the biggest loss in the world but you have the acquired AP here for like party for a rainbow party it's not element locked and as we talked about what he does when he heals people he gives them AP his TMR also some like AP reduction and AP restoration so when you're talking about like a support if you know what I mean where you're playing a lot of those games with generating a lot of AP for your teammates I think the increase of acquired AP of 50% can potentially potentially be a big part of that even if it is only the sub card but uh, the fact that it's a rainbow vision card you can put it on and help your teammates no matter what the element i think is kind of an upside there and then the only other ones i hear i think are like water oriented vision cards where if you are going to be putting them in a water comp so you can have that hybrid i do think holiday party is a great card no matter what uh, it does give aoe resistance for the entire party regardless of the elements so i think that's an absolutely fantastic thing while giving your water friends a dexterity buff of 35 percent and he will also have access to this ability the holy night purge because he have the he has the arithmetician job so i think this is a great vision card for that and then i actually think a vow to meet again is another good one and that's really the the gist of all of the vision cards obviously there's a little bit of flexibility here but it's not as cookie cutter as it might be for most other units and now when we talk about notable espers again as a support it's kind of difficult because you're trying to figure out do you want to make them as survivable as possible do you go for more aggressive ai overall my personal opinion i actually don't think there's any single one good esper except for maybe like two or three here where as we talked about in the vision cards here i do like phrases as a lot for a esper where you're giving him spirit you're giving him magic attack maybe some crit evasion ice attack this overall is like an absolutely fantastic esper to potentially put on him but other than that i actually would try to attempt to just boost up his agility as much as possible because here's the thing if he's too slow and his teammates because he's so slow and his teammates start taking damage if he's constantly just forced to like be a heal bot and heal up teammates because he doesn't get a turn often enough to like keep up with the enemy turn order of doing damaging abilities then he's basically just going to heal a ton so from that perspective i would like to try to find ways to really bump up his agility as much as possible so that he can keep up with the turn order of the enemies and give him some opportunity to do some damaging abilities in addition to having to heal. So from that perspective, I really think it just comes down to like who are the fastest espers that you could possibly put on them. And obviously some of them that come to mind and obviously are magic oriented here are Bahamut, number one, like de facto the best magic esper overall. I actually think my personal favorite out of all of these to some degree is Shiva because uh, she is a fast esper at 20 agility, like amongst some of the fastest, but you also get a fantastic amount of accuracy from her board as well, which she needs. In addition to magic attack, you know, the ice attack, you have pierce resistance here as well so overall a lot of good things from the shiva board where i think she'd probably be near the top of my list to rezo him with i think your rope was another half decent one here where if you look at the skill tree there's magic attack there's critical evasion it's missile or pierce resistance but it is known for being fast at 18 agility and that's really the espers in a nutshell obviously you can pick a whole bunch of different espers if you want to go for certain kinds of resistances or agility tuning just to strategically determine your turn order but those are some of my favorites and when we talk about weapon optimization this actually is kind of a weakness of his in my opinion and that's just because there isn't a huge variety of books to choose from. So a lot of other weapons, you can, you know, be very strategic with how you do it. But for him, the de facto number one that comes to mind is his uh, tome that came out with uh, his release here. Gelu Mortis, I think it's called, where uh, obviously like fantastic, I would ignore the vital build. Obviously fantastic magic stat here. The 10 accuracy isn't terribly impactful. You would probably want a little bit more for him. But the spear penetration is fair enough as well where if you're going against high spirit enemies it's pretty decent because the only other tome you have to potentially use is the lunar tome and this is probably the one that i 
lean to a little bit closer where uh, I would want the aim build. This 20 accuracy is more impactful than the 10 on the other. And me personally, I would want the magic attack rather than the spirit penetration because just speaking out loud here, you really want spirit penetration for tank oriented characters. And to me, Velus probably isn't going to do a ton of like tank damaging, if you will, to start the battle. He'll probably be healing his teammates to until like the battle starts to go in your favor, at which point, once you cleave through the tank and you're attacking the remaining DPS, let's say, and again, I always kind of go worst case scenario here and think like Lock Elena, even Wynn is getting evadey to some degree now with Leela and some of the Wynn cards. So like when I think of them, I would want the magic attack modifier because I know they're not going to have very high spirit levels and I'm stacking for the accuracy so that I know that I can hit all those, uh, you know, squishy characters no matter what. So I'm probably aiming toward the Lunar Tome over his book. Personally, I don't think the drop-off in magic is terribly, terribly significant overall. And then we get into trust zone recommendations. So again, I really only talk about it from the perspective of the set abilities, not, not so much the passives, because the passives are very much uh, specific and random and, and whatnot. But uh, number one, I do like the HP one overall, where you know any attempt to make him more bulky, I think is a good thing, just so he doesn't die and keep his teammates up. I think this is a great one. I think a second one that I have not recommended in any of these character reviews yet is actually the defense one. So one of the things that um, I kind of, I knew about, but I kind of didn't know fully about is that on each trust stone, depending on the type that you pick, you get a, we'll call it a main stat. To that type so if you pick the hp type you will get hp as a main stat on the trust stone if you pick defense type you will get defense as a main stat on the trust stone so again we're using wotp calc for this what that essentially means is we're going to use ur as the example if you pick a defensive stone and you level it to level 20 you will get four defense from it well when you're equipping a set and you really always should means you equip three of them that means you'll have 12 defense when you apply the three of them together, plus the set bonus of another three defense, so 15 total defense and healing power 10. So as we were talking about before, if you want to try to like not use that scholarly passive for the 15 defense, I think you could easily put in this trust stone instead to kind of even out his resistances where he's already so good in the spirit, you know, make him balanced on the defense side, or, or you can do spirit, nothing wrong with that either. But not only do you get that extra bulkiness, but you also get the healing power of 10, which isn't enormously substantial, but like it kind of is when you combine it with his passive, that an extra 30 healing power ends up being pretty potent. And then obviously I think the uh, the crit of eight is another good one here. Same theory as why you would go for HP, just because his luck stat overall is a little bit on the lower side, he's not going to evade a bunch of critical attacks. And the last thing you want is for him to just be dying too early. So crit evasion can potentially be your friend there. And on the offensive side, I do like the magic nodes a lot. Uh, not, you know, spear penetration of 10 is kind of whatever, in my opinion, it's it's fine. But it really is just to kind of maximize his magic stats so that he can uh, do more healing. And as we were talking about main stats here, you'll get a bunch of extra magic potentially from doing this as well, which will help his curative ability. Uh, accuracy, I also think has a time and place where we're talking about building accuracy in a variety of ways. Literally no problem throwing on this on him as well. And then finally, I actually like the agility one. Uh, I haven't recommended this for non-evade units because a lot of people really use this for that extra five evasion rate. It sounds dumb, but this extra three agility with the other three agility, I think it's a total of six you end up getting, um, is huge. And as we're talking about like turn order here, if you can make him as fast as possible with the haste, I think he's going to be able to be both a you know potent damage dealer as well as a great support and healer. So I actually like the agility build for that reason as well. So that's the Velus review in a nutshell. Super exciting character, very unique support. I love that he's, you know, the element that feeds into the hybrid water uh, element matchup as well. And from everything I know, he is going to be pretty powerful for a fairly significant amount of time. So very much excited to uh, putting him into the game currently and seeing what he can do. But good luck polling. Hopefully this was informative. And as usual, comments, questions, critiques, all in the comment section below. Love to interact with everybody. And I will talk to you all soon.